Gupta. So I again namaskar to all of you. And then I'm Thank very you. happy that um, many of the viewers are con uh, continuously getting attached with this series. And we are starting with the sixth uh, program in this series. As we all know, we have also started one more uh, series of NAC Varta. In comparative to this, both are running very good and we are getting very much good response in this. So uh, in this uh, Upanyasa uh, Malika, uh, today's program is on the topic concept clarification and operationalization of the criteria for NAC assessment and accreditation process in which our NAC director, Professor S.C. Sarma, who is known to be a great orator and researcher, will speak and interact with you on the conceptual clarification of assessment criteria. And then it will be followed by the Dr. Srikanta Swami sir, who is an academic expert of the research and analysis wing, uh, and will speak uh, on the operationalization of the criteria for the NAC assessment and accreditation process. Now, taking uh, not taking much more of the time, I would like to uh, uh, request our first our director, sir, Professor S. C. Sharma, sir, who will be speaking on the uh, which I said conceptualization, clarification of NAC assessment criteria, and then followed by the uh, our uh, uh, great researcher, uh, Dr. Sri Kanta Swami, sir. So I request now NAC director, uh, Professor S. C. Sharma, sir, to speak on this. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Today's topic on Upanyas Malika is on conceptual clarifications of NAC assessment criteria. Again, I am grateful to my colleague Professor Srikanta Swami, who is a senior most educationalist of our state, and uh, it is his idea, and and I am grateful to him. He has been working very hard uh, in bringing out the, this Upanyas Malika. I am also grateful to my other colleagues in NAC who have been very uh, helpful in preparing this document. Educational assessment or educational evaluation is a systematic process of documenting and using empirical data on the knowledge, skill, attitudes and beliefs to refine programs and improve student learning. Well, assessment data can be obtained from directly examining students' work to assess the achievement of learning outcomes or can be based on data from which one can make inferences about learning. Assessment is often uh, interchangeable with test but not limited to tests. Assessment can focus on the individual learner, the learning community class, workshop or, or other organized group of learners, a course, an academic program, the institution or the educational system as a whole. As a continuous process, assessment establishes memorable and clear student learning outcomes for learning, uh, provisioning a sufficient amount of learning opportunities to achieve these outcomes implementing a systematic way of gathering, analyzing and interpreting evidence to determine how well student learning matches expectations and using the collected information to inform improvement in student learning. The final purpose of assessment practices in education depends on theoretical framework of the practitioner and researchers, their assumptions and belief about uh, the nature of humankind, the orig origin of knowledge and the process of learning. Next, let me talk something about accreditation. Accreditation being a quality, any university or higher education institution which is recognized to possess certain say, set of quality standards, we say it is accredited. It is, it is, is more of a diagnostic tool. Accreditation is, is made obli obligatory for all higher education institutions by 2020. The stress is more when the state universities strive for UGC grant, financial aid, RUSA grants, as NAC is linked to funding uh, for the government run institutions. NAC, NAC's uh, A and A process uh, is not a simple task. There are lots and lots of data gathering and compilation. 
reporting that has to go hand in hand the process. This has been attempted as a continuance of NAC's concern for ensuring that its A and A processes are in tune with the needs and changes in the local, regional and global scenario of higher education. The main focus of revision process has been, has been to enhance the redeeming features of accreditation process and make them more robust and of course it is all completely ICT driven. The revised process is an outcome of the feedback received by NAC from various consultative meetings, expert groups, uh, meetings and uh, which comprised eminent academicians representing from universities and colleges and various other sectors also in higher education. And uh, um, we, we also specifically from academia during assessor, assessor interaction meetings, AIM, we have got a lot of inputs and we have, we have included all these things in the new manual. And, uh, Keeping this in mind, manuals have been brought out for various universities, autonomous colleges, affiliated constituent colleges, broader and, and continuous revision has also been done. And the self-study report forms the backbone of the entire process of accreditation and special efforts have been made to differentiate some of the items to render appropriate and applicable to different key criteria of institution. The core value of NAC considering the need to expand the system of higher education in the country, the impact of modern technology on educational delivery, the increasing private participation in higher education and impact of globalization. This form the core, core values. The, uh, uh, in the accreditation framework of NAC is based on five core, core, core values. One is contributing to the nation, national development, fostering global competencies among students, inculcating a value system among students, and then promoting the use of technology, which is very, very important. The whole country and the whole world is moving towards digi digi digitalization. And then, of course, with all these things, it's quest of excellence. This quest of excellence could start with the assessment and or even earlier. You know, you have the self-study reports of an institution and uh, the most important thing in the higher education institution is the internal quality assurance cells. So these people, so the, the higher education institutions submit annual quality assurance reports and for a period of five years continuously, if this is done very honestly and the SSR preparation is very easy. Of course, it also gives the gap analysis, quality gap analysis and spot analysis. And the five core values are as outlined above form the foundation of assessment. Now, what is the focus of assessment? The focus of assessment is to enhance the quality sustenance and then uh, improve the organization operations and processes in line with NAC's conviction that Quality concerns are institutional. Uh, quality assessment can, can better be done through self-evaluation, the self-evaluation process and subsequent preparation of the self-study report to be submitted to NAC involves the, the participation of all stakeholders, management and faculty members, administrative staff, students, parents, employers, community and alumni. While the participation of internal stakeholders, management, staff and students provide credibility and ownership uh, to the activity and could lead to newer initiatives, interactions and overall there is a quality improvement. It is attempted uh, to enlarge the digital coverage of the entire process of A and A. This has been done. Now, quality indicator framework, QIF description, the criteria based assessment forms uh, the backbone of assessment and accreditation process of NAC. There are seven criteria. Criteria one is curricular aspect. Criteria two, teaching learning. Criteria three, research innovation. Four is infrastructure and, and learning resources. Five is student support and progression. Six is governance, leadership and management. 
seventh is institutional value and best practices under each criteria a few key indicators are identified and these key indicator are further delineated into matrix so from big a uh, smaller one from smaller one uh, uh, you know uh, the questions are are being uh, framed uh, all of you know that this is called as matrix now criteria of curricular aspect there are four indicators what are these four indicators the curriculum design is important planning and implementation then the academic flexibility it should not be too rigid curriculum enhancement feedback system and for criteria 2 we have uh, key indicators such as student enrollment and the profile uh, student diversity teaching learning teaching profile evaluation process student performance and learning outcomes and student satisfaction survey and criteria 3 research innovation and extension this is most important you know with scopus index papers research grants patents etc and i think last in the last uh, mm, lecture i did mention about research criteria and then its key uh, indicators are promotion of research uh, and facilities uh, resource mobilization and then uh, innovation ecosystem research publications and consultancy extension activity criteria 4 is infrastructure and learning resources the adequacy and optimal use of facilities available in an institution are essential to maintain the quality of academic and other programs on campus so expansion of facilities to meet future development is included this is important and then the key indicators are physical facilities library as a learning resource i in it infrastructure and maintenance of campus and criteria 5 is student support and progression all hcis and all of us are there for students therefore it highlights a, a, a vast gamut of of metrics and experiences of learning at campus to facilitate their holistic development and progression and its key indicators are student support student progression student participation and alumni engagement criteria 6 is on on uh, governance and leadership where its institutional vision strategy development and deployment faculty empowerment financial management and resource mobilization internal quality assurance system and criteria 7 is institutional values and best practices any good thing that is done in the interest of the society and institute becomes an institutional a uh, good practice the key indicators would be institutional values and social responsibility best practices and institutional distinctiveness so uh, you know divyanjan uh, friendliness uh, to to the uh, 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 to to people with differently able and effective dealing of vocational advantage and disadvantage situation etc human values best practices institutional distinctiveness every institution would like to be recognized for certain of its attributes which make it different from other institute distinct such attributes characterize the institution and are reflected in all its activities in focus and practice so uh, well this is all known to higher education institutions in the website it is clearly mentioned and we seek your um, guidance and advice to improve further improve nax process thank you very much namaste thank you uh, i thank sincerely uh, professor s a sharma ji for having spoken with lot of clarity with respect to the criteria and also the need and importance of the assessment accreditation which is very much necessary in order to improve quality in higher education institutions in continuation of the same thing i would like to proceed with the my talk and the title of my talk is operationalization of criteria for nac assessment and accreditation process operationalization of the criteria which is very very important and most of you are all very familiar about this process 
Uh, therefore, once again, my uh, formal good evening to all of you. I am going to start this. As we discussed earlier, accreditation is very important. Lot of advantages are there in this accreditation process. But in order to arrive at this manual, separately for universities, separately for colleges, autonomous colleges, I think uh, all my earlier uh, experts, directors, including our Professor S. 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 Sharmaji, uh, they have discussed, they have debated, and ultimately it has taken this present shape. And now we are continuing using these manuals for the purpose of accrediting higher education institutions. Now this uh, accreditation, when we wanted to do it, there are two approaches according to me. One approach is to have a better clarity regarding the roles and functions of higher education institutions. What all that they are doing, we have to take the database of all those things, that they, whatever that they are doing in the name of curricular activities, in the name of co-curricular activities, in the name of research, and all the seven criteria, whatever you have discussed, taking note of that and how exactly the universities and colleges are functioning, keeping that as a basis, developing the manual and proceeding. This is one approach. The other approach is keeping the aims of education <clears throat> on the top and at the same time, keeping the expectations of higher educational institutions <clears throat> accordingly developing the manual this is also another approach therefore both the approaches are very good very important integration of these two approaches equally uh, brings quality for the manual whatever we are going to use it which makes it little more objective in nature and helps higher education institutions to get the benefit therefore my appreciation towards all those who have developed now i am going to discuss very much in detail regarding the operationalization of the criteria for NAC assessment and accreditation. Now, what is this? Uh, uh, first point is regarding the NAC has been carrying out the process of quality assessment and accreditation of higher education institutions over the past more than two decades. In fact, you are all familiar. This year is the Silver Jubilee year of NAC, and since almost 25 years, NAC has involved in the process of accrediting universities as well as colleges, and it has covered almost 24% nearly. There are still a lot of things to do it, but with all these things, I think it has created a beautiful landmark wherein all higher education institutions have got a lot of benefit in order to maintain quality, in order to proceed with the concept of sustainability. True to its commitment for promoting quality culture, in higher education institutions, in consonance with the overall developments in the field of higher education in the outside world. NAC has been trying to be sensitive to adequ adequately reflect these in its processes. The a and process of NAC continues to be an exercise in partnership with the HEI being assessed. As known, the revision of the a and process of NAC has been done to accelerate the process with greater rigor, as and when any kind of new changes or inclusion or additions that is there, and keeping that aspect in mind, taking stock of all those aspects, little revision also has been done. <clears throat> now, the revised assessment accreditation framework was launched in the year 2017. It represents an explicit paradigm shift, making it ICT enabled. Friend, this is important. This is what we have been stressing. ICT is ICT enabled, more objective in nature. It is more transparent in nature. It is scalable and robust. In fact, the present 2017, that revised manual, what we are using, <coughs> it is institutional friendly. The shift comprises of from the previous qualitative peer deemed judgment to, <coughs> sorry, data-based quantitative indicator evaluation with increased objectivity and transparency towards extensive use of ICT confirming scalability and robustness as I mentioned. In terms of simplification of the process, there is a reduction in the number of questions. Already people have debated and the experts 
from the field of measurement and evaluation and statistics, they say, if the number of items in the tool, if it is reduced, it may not add on to reliability. On the other hand, if too much of items are there, it may not encourage the institutions to provide the data accordingly with all the necessary evidences. Therefore, experts' opinion was also taken into consideration and thereby the total number of metrics also has been reduced in our revised uh, 2017 manual. Reduction in the number of peer team visit days, another way. Therefore, reduction with respect to the number of items, reduction with respect to the size of the SSR, what they are supposed to submit, and reduction in the number of peer team visit days also. Boosting benchmarking as quality improvement tool. This has been attempted through comparison of NAC indicators with those of other international quality assurance frameworks. Therefore, while preparing this manual, <clears throat> we also have kept the international framework pertaining to the quality assessment and accordingly bridging was done and the manual has been developed. Introducing the system generated scores. This is another unique point. Most of you are very familiar. We have got system generated scores, not manually prepared, manually added and developed. Therefore, in the ICT unit of NAC, automatically whatever the scores that we are going to feed in, in terms of quality, quantitative matrix, as well as in terms of qualitative, that is generated there. And hence we use this as system generated scores. That is another important uh, uh, attribute uh, to, uh, to convince the people that it is more institutional friendly and it is more objective and at the same time it is scientific in nature. Introducing pre-qualifier before the peer team visit. I think uh, you are also very much familiar. If you submit your SSR, keep in the quantity matrix, they will test. And if you score more than 30% earlier, you are qualified and you are allowed to continue in the assessment and accreditation process. But there were many institutions, especially with respect to government and rural based institutions, they expressed their inability because of lack of ICT facilities in their institutions and because of uh, the facilities which are not available with respect to the documentation process. They appealed and it was very well taken by the uh, higher officials of NAC, very well taken by the director, present director. And ultimately, they said by taking the expert's opinion, better to reduce it at the entry point from 30% to 25%. Because after all, the NAC is there to encourage higher education institutions to come forward for accreditation. So we are here to help. Therefore, it has been reduced from 30% to 25%. This is another additional encouragement for all those who were hesitating to come based on the concept of fear of failure concept. Now they are encouraged, they are coming. This is another interesting change that we have noticed here. Then introducing the element of the third party validation of data. Therefore, whatever the data you are submitting to the NAC, NAC officials could check, they can certify, they can accept it, keeping the standard operation procedure wherein we have mentioned that this document means or this document wants or this is how the document should be. Like that, we had a common understanding between what NAC is talking about the documentation and what the institution is expected to understand the meaning of the documentation and provide the document in the same manner. But now it has been given to the third party in the name of DVV, where they are going to validate the data. And therefore, the third party, the NAC is also not knowing what they are doing. Higher education institutions also do not know what the third party validation process is, but it has been done with lot of objectivity, keeping the higher education institutions into confidence as well as NAC. Providing appropriate differences in the metrics, weightages, and benchmarks between those of the universities, autonomous colleges, and affiliated or constrained colleges. <clears throat> because we cannot have the same measuring yard for universities as well as colleges. Because in universities, they can develop and design their own curriculum. Whereas affiliated colleges, they may not be having so much of freedom. 
So for keeping these aspects in mind, we wanted to have some kind of distinction between university manual, then college manual, as well as that of the autonomous college manual. Then revising several metrics to bring in enhanced participation of students and alumni in the assessment process. This is very, very important. In some of the universities, you, you must be knowing, in some of the colleges, they believe in 360 degree evaluation. Therefore, by using the 360 degree evaluation, the evaluation procedure will become robust and it is possible for us to find out which are the missing elements in that link to so that we can check and we can improve the quality. Therefore, in the revised manual, revising several metrics to bring in enhanced participation is also done, keeping the uh, role of the alumni on one hand, participation of students on the other hand. Some metrics were modified. I think you are also familiar. And for further details, kindly refer to our manual, which are there in our website. Higher education institutions, if they have a record of at least two batches of students graduated or have been in existence for six years, whichever is earlier are eligible to apply. And in fact, I was also involved, as I mentioned earlier, as a self appraisal coordinator. And during those days, we were submitting everything in terms of hard copy. Nowadays, they are expecting everything in terms of soft copy. Therefore, if the institution and if the principal and the IQSC coordinators, they should be very, very much familiar about this a and &A process. If the familiarity is there, possibility of getting a better marks will be there. Better understanding of the matrix is there. It leads to better possibility of providing the evidences in a better way by means of which the possibility of getting the grade will also be very high. Therefore, we I'm starting from the basic thing, who are eligible? Now we made it mandatory. Earlier we said optional, whoever wants they can come. Now it is mandatory. All higher education institutions should undergo. But in future, the national education policy is also insisting that all higher education institutions by 2030 or some timeline they have given, within that they should be accredited. If there is no accreditation means very difficult for them to exist. Therefore, it is necessary and the minimum when to start at, as I've given a clue here, any higher education institution, which has uh, completed two batches of students or completed six years, whichever is earlier, he is eligible to apply for accreditation, whichever is earlier, as I mentioned. Then, uh, the assessment accreditation of NAC and fulfill the other conditions as are covered by the other provisions. I think uh, registration is a mandatory. Without that registration, you cannot proceed. Like that, there are basic things you have to keep in mind. And uh, then, without understanding the basic steps which are involved, you may find it very difficult. That's why today we are going to discuss a little more on the operationalization of this assessment criteria. Now, let me take the example of universities first, because we have got a manual for universities. Under universities, we have got central universities, state and private universities, uh, deemed to be universities, and uh, then uh, instead of national importance also we have got. Uh, then provided the institutions are deemed to be universities and their off-campus, if any, are approved by the MHRD. I think here one basic rule, <coughs> earlier some people had this idea. The general universities, uh, they have got freedom to give affiliation. They can also establish constant colleges elsewhere. Whereas deemed universities, when they have started, they also said, we are also having power uh, to give affiliation to the colleges. I think somewhere it was checked. They said, no, no. If you want, you can have your branches in two or three places, but you will not be given permission in order to uh, affili give affiliation to the colleges, degree colleges. And that's why when a deemed university is coming for affiliation, we put this condition deemed to be universities and their off campuses, if in case they are having, and they, are, they also should be approved by the MHRD and then they can come. If a university has got a branch in Delhi, if a university has got a branch in Bombay, 
but the deemed university has got a base in Bangalore, let us say, then they should have obtained the MHRD and UGC permission. And then you can just say, this deemed university has got a campus in other two places, and therefore they can come for that. And the other uh, uh, places are also treated as branches, and then they can go for uh, the accreditation process. Here, provided further that the duly established campuses within the country, if any, shall be treated as part of the universities. We cannot treat them as separate college, separate constant college, we cannot, but they are part of the universities. In that way, it will, be, it will be treated and including the institution of national importance for the ANDA process. The colleges or institutions not affiliated. I, I think one minute, but let's I'll skip the pre previous one. Let me check. Uh, is, uh, Suresh, kindly just open that. Uh, no, no, under this uh, affiliated college also, certain terms and conditions we have laid, who can come and how exactly that they can be involved in the process of accreditation, which I have already mentioned. Okay, kindly magnify that after university. So, yeah, so you can go to slideshow and then you can uh, enlarge. Slideshow. Yeah, then the, uh, after that, we have got autonomous colleges. Autonomous colleges are constant colleges, affiliate colleges. We have got a manual for that. And then the colleges are affiliated to a university, recognized by UGC for the purpose of affiliation. Constant colleges have a private and deemed to be universities are considered as the constant units of the universities, as I mentioned. And thus will not be considered for a India process independently. So we cannot have or they cannot come for independent assessment, they will be treated as part of the university only. I think that is the point that I have just highlighted. Then accredited higher education institutions applying for, I think Suresh it has jumped. Uh, please check. Okay, one minute. Yes, the co colleges is, oh, colleges, I think this is important. The colleges or institutions not affiliated to a university are also there. There are few uh, institutions or colleges which are not directly uh, part or affiliated to the universities, but they are offering programs. But these programs are recognized by some statutory professional regularity councils. Like AACT must have recognized an institution. MCA, Medical Council of India, or, or we can just say Indian Council for Agricultural Research, National Council for Teacher Education, uh, Rehabilitation Council uh, of India for Special Education, uh, Dental Council of India, like that there are many professional regulatory councils are, are, are there. They must have recognized some uh, uh, universities, uh, some institutes or some colleges and they also can be treated maybe independent and they can come and they have been recognized by association of indian universities or sometimes uh, from the government agencies also they have been recognized and they also can come for accreditation therefore i think who can come other than the colleges i think i have mentioned here then accredited higher education institutions applying for reassessment or subsequent cycles like cycle one they have completed they can come for cycle two those who have completed cycle two, they can come for cycle three. Those who have completed cycle three, they can come for cycle four. I think that provision is also there and thereby an university or a college coming under different cycles will get an idea how they are progressing. Therefore, first assessment accreditation is over. After five years, when they come, they will try to know where do they stand. Similarly, during the second, after completing the second cycle, when they come for the third cycle, where do they stand? In that way, by participating in different cycles of accreditation, an institution will get an idea how it is progressing. This also will make the stakeholders to understand that here is a college or here is an university which is functioning consistently with lot of reliability and it is progressing in the expert direction. They possess faith in sending their own children to these colleges and universities. Then another important provision what that has been made in the accreditation process is institutions which would like to make an improvement in the accredited status. 
may apply for reassessment after a minimum of one year and before three years of accreditation. I think this is also familiar to most of you. Like an institution has come for accreditation, after five years they have come, they have come for the first cycle, accreditation is over. But they feel that, no, sir, we are not happy about our uh, uh, performance. Therefore, we want to come for reassessment because we wanted to improve ourselves. Can we come once again? Now it has been accredited. Five years over, accreditation is over, but still we are not happy. We have wanted to improve. Can we come? I think NAC had made a provision. They are saying that after a minimum of one year and before the three years of accreditation, they can come and they can get themselves uh, re-accredited or re-accredited so that they can improve and they can show that the reassessment has benefited to them. I think that provision is also there. Institutions opting for subsequent cycles of accreditation can submit the institutional information for quality assessment. I think any, any institution, first time if they wanted to come, they have to register and after registering, then they can apply through this process which begins with IIQA, submission of this institutional information for quality assessment. You have to give all the details about your institution, your name, what category you come under, how exactly, uh, the other aspects with respect to the uh, IIQA. I think that is equally important. And then the experts will go through the information whatever you have provided in the IIQA and then they'll say, during the last six months of the validity period, this is also very important. Supposing you have completed five years, you want to come for the second cycle. Then if, the, if your date is over by 2021, let us say, to December 2021, it will be over. Then you need not wait 2021. Six months prior to it, you can start submitting your IIQA so that the process for the second cycle begins and you can proceed with that. I think that's the information I'm giving here. The assessment process, taking cognizance of the diversity in the kinds of institutions, uh, they have been grouped under the three categories, namely universities, autonomous colleges, uh, then and affiliated slash constant colleges, as I mentioned. Uh, therefore, different categories are there. You have to mention under what category you come. Do you come under university category, deemed university category, central university category, or autonomous college category? or constant colleges category, or affiliated colleges category. The assessment process will be carried out in three stages, which is, which is very, very important and you must be familiar. As stated earlier, it will comprise three main components like self-study report. After your IIQA, we are interested to know about your institution. Therefore, we ask you to submit a report which contains all information pertaining to your institution. It is self-study report. Anyone who reads that report should be able to understand when it started, with what objective it has started, what, what about its vision, its mission, its core values. Like that, starting from that particular year of establishment, all the details pertaining to it, you should be able to submit that report now online. And it is called self-study report because anybody reads should be able to understand all the information. That's why it is user friendly. Uh, it will be very easy to fill it up, provided you have prepared and you have got all kinds of necessary documents. I have come across some people at the time of filling these SSR, they keep on searching for all, yes, all kinds of documents. Sometimes they cook up the documents. Ultimately, when these documents, cooked up documents come to a DVV process, I think they will not consider, they may reject it. Therefore, well in advance, before going to the filling up of this SSR, acquaint yourselves about all those aspects which are there in that SSR, all those aspects. The key indicators information, metrics information, QNM information, quantitative metrics information, quality metrics information, everything should be uh, understood very well in advance so that without any kind of error, if you can submit, possibility of acceptance will be more. Then along with that, among uh, a few accrediting agencies, one more best practice what they have selected is to collect the opinion from the students. Because your self-study report contains all kinds of information where you have documented and reported. 
but we do not know what the students are going to say. Management say, oh, we are doing very well. We are functioning very well. The teaching faculty may say we are doing very well. Researchers may say we are doing very well. Since we have given more weightage to the teaching and learning process, we wanted to know from the students only. Therefore, a student satisfaction survey is administered and collected and ultimately it goes to the ICT department where they are going to assess upon. And it contains almost 21 questions. 20 may be a structured one uh, coming under multiple choice type. It is a fixed response type. The last one is open. Whatever we have not covered within the 20, student has got freedom to comment about it. Therefore, this uh, student satisfaction survey gives us an idea because the students are the beneficiaries. They are the uh, uh, people who are going to get a lot of benefits from higher education institutions. Uh, their job placement depends upon how the university is going to or how the college is going to empower them. Therefore, we wanted to know what they are interested to say. That's why we have got yes, yes, yes. And the peer team report, there's the last one which is equally important. Earlier, more weightage was there. Now the peer team members have got only a smaller weightage when they go for a visit to assess, maybe around 30% weightage that they are having. And they are supposed to look into only the quality metrics. However, they should also go with a better understanding of the QNM pertaining to that university or that college. The SSR has a total of 115 metrics for universities, 107 metrics for uh, autonomous colleges, and definitely we have reduced it to UG and PG, wherein we have got 93 metrics for UG and uh, 96 metrics for uh, the uh, PG courses. Then the SSR has two kinds of metrics, as I mentioned. One is about the qualitative metrics. This number has been increased. The percentage has been increased. Earlier it was less. Um, uh, now it is more. And even regarding this also, a lot of debate has occurred. People have debated that. Can we have 70% QNM and 30% QNM? Or can we have 80% uh, QNM and 20% QLM? Lot of debate. Still we are open to get the suggestions from all experts. I think based upon the feedback, whatever we have received, based upon the expert's opinion, it is not advisable to reduce the QLM to less than 30%. The moment you reduce it to less than 30%, the members representing institutions like you will say, sir, <clears throat> what the PRT members will come under with the 20% weightage of marks in their hand. 80% already over you are saying and how can we convince them with that 20% or 30% 30 if it is less than 30 as I said. That's why timing we have kept 30% only, <clears throat> but still it is a significant uh, uh, percentage. Still with that 30%, they can judge the quality of our institution. Then I think uh, uh, as I mentioned in our manual, we have got uh, <clears throat> the first point, uh, the manual for university. Under that, the seven criteria, which are very important. Then under each criteria, we have got the key indicators. And within the key indicator, we have got the matrix. And therefore, the assessment of the matrix coming under the key indicator, referring to a particular uh, criteria. That's why in the final assessment sheet, the criteria wise, the assessment will be done. And adding up the total CGPA, it gives the total uh, CGPA uh, the marks for the uh, uh, collective marks of the community marks of all the seven criteria represents a particular uh, value. <clears throat> Based upon that value, they are going to declare whether you come under the A plus plus grade or A grade or B plus plus. Now let us try to know the uh, distribution of this key KAs and metrics uh, from university to the autonomous college. How it is different? Autonomous to the constant colleges. How it will be different? Let us just look into it. Now here you can see uh, the uh, uh, key indicators wise, universities we have got almost 34, autonomous colleges also we have got 34 key indicators because key indicators means 
they are the indicators which will tell us the performance of the institutions, key indicators. Like in an electrical circuit, if you wanted to plug for some iron box or something, the moment you plug, there can be a light. And light is an indicator. Therefore, it indicates that the current is passing through the device. If that light is not there, then uh, you have to follow the other methods to test whether the current is passing through it or not. That's when most of the gadgets, they put one small uh, green uh, light or red light because they indicate that the current is there. Functioning started like that it indicates. In the same way here, the 34 indicators, they speaks about the performance of the university or higher education institution under different aspects. That's the 34 we kept. Why 34? There is a rationale. Then similarly for affiliated and constant colleges, we have got 31, 32. And the qualitative matrix, we have got almost 36 qualitative matrix for universities, uh, 35 for the autonomous colleges, and 35 for affiliated and 36 for the PG. Then with respect to quantitative matrix, quantitative matrix means around 79 for universities, 72 for autonomous colleges, uh, 58 or, or some 60 between affiliated and constant colleges. Affiliate colleges comes under the university. <clears throat> constant colleges may be recognized by the councils as I mentioned earlier. Now here, what is this quantitative and qualitative? I think you are all familiar. Uh, in the case of quantitative, we are we go for getting the uh, the response in terms of numbers. That's why we call them as quantitative matrix, like the percentage of students studying in the college, uh, percentage of uh, teachers guiding the PhD scholars. Therefore, the, uh, in all these cases, we are going to get a number. Based on that number, we are going to judge. Hence, we call it as a quantitative matrix. Whereas in quantitative matrix, something like a, a descriptive question, like where they are going to describe in 500 words or in 1000 words <clears throat> about a particular process, about a particular mechanism, or about a particular best practice. So by looking at into it, it is possible for us to read and understand, comprehend and understand what that they are doing. In quantum matrix now, we ourselves are we are asking them to provide like percentage of uh, the students getting the scholarship or percentage of students from neighboring states uh, we ask but many of you are very good in in giving the numerical values because it is easy uh, and sometimes we come across some of the institutions based upon the guess technique they have given the information i am not exaggerating it's a fact also but we request you to kindly do not do it. Read that matrix carefully and find out what that they are asking. And there is a data template attached to it. And the data template, if you look, you will get an idea how you are supposed to provide the data part into this quantitative matrix. First five years data, if they are asking, refer to data template, it will give you what is the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, how you have to give it. I sometimes you have to use the formula like that in quantum matrix usually some options we have given you have to select one accordingly we refer to the benchmark and we give a weightage to it or sometimes you have to give, uh, give there will be a formula you have to use the formula and work out a percentage use a formula and find out the ratio like that in quantum matrix there are four to five types are there if we refer to the manual you can understand the difference between quantitative matrix as well as qualitative matrix, but both are important. I think you will get an idea about how our key indicators, quantitative matrix, qualitative matrix have been distributed and overall how many, many um, the metrics or the questions will be there. You also will get an idea. As you can make out here, universities will be having more, 115. And then comes autonomous colleges because they have got freedom. They say they are having potential and uh, they, they can do a lot of uh, excellent things. Therefore, they have got freedom. They can do better. Therefore, we are asking more questions to verify those things. Then similarly, with respect to UG, it is less and PG, it can be less, slightly more. And uh, that is how the distribution is there. Now, let us uh, go a little more in detail with respect to the criterion wise of the distribution. It is familiar. 
but uh, one or two points I am going to highlight. That's why I'm keeping this table here. Uh, number one, with respect to curricular aspect, you can just see here, university, if you take here, certain things are applicable not to universities and not to co autonomous colleges, but they are applicable to only affiliated or constant colleges, like curricular planning and implementation. Then academic flexibility, I think universities have got more freedom. That's why academic flexibility is considered uh, we have got a weightage of 50 and uh, autonomous colleges we have got 40 and affiliated council colleges we have got 30 30 because ug and pg may not be having so much of flexibility with respect to academic aspects certain things are prefixed the professors are supposed to carry on those things whereas in the university they have got a lot of freedom they can modify they can suggest modifications that the reason that variation is there Similarly, with respect to curriculum enrichment, therefore, whatever the curriculum, curriculum is the totality of experiences, whatever we are uh, supposed to do it in a university. That may include curricular aspect, maybe on one hand, co-curricular external activities, maybe other hand, the totality, whatever you do it in total, theory, practicals, everything that comes under that. And therefore, for the curricular enrichment, uh, for universities, we have got 30 only. Whereas autonomous colleges, I think more freedom, as I said, 40. In that way, a little bit variation. But ultimately, if you compare, for criteria one, maximum 150 marks weightage. And then autonomous colleges, we have got 150 weightage. And then other things, we have got 100, 100 only. Therefore, here, with respect to curricular aspect, in total, if you take now, the difference is not much between uh, weightage for universities and weightage for colleges. Then the second one is about teaching and learning. Uh, we, it is the core of all higher education institutions. Uh, therefore, more weightage is also there that you can see here. Uh, for universities, we have got uh, uh, maybe 200. Then we have got 300. Then we will be having 350, 350. Uh, therefore, uh, little more because in uh, universities, uh, we emphasize upon the research work, maybe perhaps because of that, the weightage is slightly uh, less compared to the autonomous colleges. Therefore, that difference you just see here. Then with respect to research, innovation and extension activities, uh, we have got uh, resource mobilization. Uh, universities can do better compared to uh, autonomous colleges. That's why it is more weightage here. Innovation ecosystem, universities can do more weightage. Then research publication and awards, very, very important because minor research projects, major research projects, universities are doing. Therefore, more weightage because greater the weightage, they can come out with a lot of evidences, thereby they get better score by means of which their total CGPA is increased. Similarly, the concept of consultancy, as I discussed earlier, it is familiar only among the universities more, not so much familiar with UG and PG. That's why we say not applicable. Then extension activities, it is also more with respect to you. Uh, autonomous. They say we go out, we reach out, we share our knowledge now. Whereas for the universities, also that they can do, but more weightage to autonomous, more weightage to UG, but maybe a uh, little less weightage to the university. I do not know why, but still I think uh, they can also readjust if need be uh, so that uh, they also can extend their activities in the name of extension activities. Collaboration, always we say, uh, higher education institutions should have collaborations, should have a MOU with other organizations. I think uh, weightage, more or less, we have given same for all. And the total, for university it is more, autonomous it is less, and similarly, it is slightly more for PG and less for UG. I think that difference is also there. Then with respect to the criteria, number one, infrastructure and the learning resources equally important. Uh, library as a, a learning resource. Now there is a paradigm shift now uh, because of this COVID situation. Uh, many people prefer to search online. Uh, they want access of library and they wanted to see there, but even then library is important, whether offline or online, people are able to uh, utilize. We want them to utilize. That's why the weightage is common for all. 
Infrastructure wise, I think it is more or less same because without infrastructure, we cannot uh, uh, achieve the objectives with which we are insisting upon practicals and other things. Maintenance of campus infrastructure, I think equal weightage, the weightage is common with respect to the infrastructure and learning resources is considered. It is common among universities, autonomous colleges, and then also with respect to the U U UG and PG courses. Then the fifth one is about student support and progression. Uh, this is a very nice concept. Uh, hats off to those who thought of this idea there, because how do we expect the students to progress himself in the organization? Uh, under that student progression, they have given 40, 30, 30, 25. Student participation that they have given 20, 30, 50, and 40. We can see here, student participation because in UG and PG, we want more interaction with the students. That's why 50 and 45 they have given. It does not mean that there should be less interaction, but different types of activities can be conducted in the university as well as autonomous colleges. Then alumni engagement, I think more or less 10. Only less weightage is given, uh, 10 only. Uh, but most of the people earlier, they didn't want to give a lot of importance to alumni engagement. Only when they knew that NAC has got a weightage for this, and when the NAC is coming, maybe one month or two months in advance, renewing the old boy association or alumni and other things, then they want to do it. But when the peer team members have explained the importance of alumni, now I think in most of the cases, I am happy they are renewing, it is functioning, and some of the alumni uh, associations. Uh, they are contributing so much to the organization <clears throat> in providing facilities, <clears throat> sorry, scholarship facilities, in developing the infrastructure they are contributing. I think in many ways they are empowering the universities and colleges. I think the importance is good and the weightage you have given, I think there is a possibility that weightage can also be increased if need be, <clears throat> depend upon. But the argument is there on both the sides, whether to increase or decrease is more or less there. Best thing is to stick on to it and proceed. And totally 100, 100, 100 marks weightage. And for the PG, they have given slightly more. <clears throat> uh, now, the seventh one is about institutional values. I think sixth one. Let's check up. Sixth one, have I completed? You know, that's why we have skipped. The sixth one is about governance, leadership, and management. This is equally important. Uh, some of these concepts have been influenced by the management experts. They have shared some of these aspects there. And they say strategic development or strategic development and deployment is equally important. As is the strategy, so will be your activities. And as is the activities, so will be the achievement. And as is the achievement, so will be the benefit for the institution, benefit for the students. Therefore, they say strategic development, a weightage has been given, not much because many people may not be familiar about that. Then faculty empowerment strategies, which is equally important. Developing the human capital, that's the word they use. How do you develop your human capital? Because higher education institutions are supposed to be the centers for knowledge economy. Therefore. Uh, faculty members, they should be equipped with the latest knowledge, latest skills, uh, then lot of competencies, uh, then without which it is very difficult for them to transfer all these things to their own students. Therefore, they say faculty uh, empowerment strategy is equally important. 30-30 they are given. Financial management and resource mobilization, I think 2020 that they are given, because finance is equally important. Without finance, very difficult to provide quality. Without finance, you can manage. But without finance now, certain areas difficult to run, difficult to perform, especially in the area of ICT related areas, it's very, very difficult. There were finance is a must. A library, for example, finance is a must for the library. Laboratories finance is a must when you wanted to run. The science programs, I think laboratories are very, very, very essential for the purpose of uh, uh, testing, conducting experiment, verification, conducting high-tech research, all these things are very important. And therefore, how to mobilize is equally important. Therefore, we ask questions 
Uh, do you have a mechanism by means of which you are mobilizing your own resources? How do you manage your uh, financial things, whatever you are having? Do you justice in spending the money, whatever you have collected? Many aspects are good. Then internal quality assurance system is equally important because quality is controlled by two factors. One is internal, another is external. The external accrediting agencies may come, but what about your internal quality assurance system? How are you assuring the quality in your own institution? As I mentioned earlier, the different models I have mentioned and uh, different certificate courses are there where organizations can participate. They can invite experts and they will assure you how you can show quality. I think 30, 30, 30, we have given totally 100 marks weightage. Now, the last one is very interesting. This is with respect to the uh, institutional values and best practices. Uh, under that, uh, we have got uh, best practices, maybe one key indicator. Institutional distinctiveness, another key indicator is there. And best practices, we have given 30, 30, 30, very important best practices. Uh, always we expect each institution to have that, uh, uh, that concept in the mind. Uh, each institution is capable of doing. Long back, I gave the example of hotel industry. I gave the example of uh, some uh, uh, malls, big malls I have given in what way they are special, how they are special, uh, somewhere or the other. Uh, you should be able to have this concept first at your institutional level. And whenever you come across some kind of challenges or problems, in the process of overcoming those problems and challenges, you definitely come across some good practices. In uh, European countries, usually they call it as good practices. Maybe we are using the word best practices. And the good practices can be borrowed, but they cannot become your own best practices because there is no guarantee that others' good practice will become your best practice. You have to work out, try out. The weightage is there. And unless there is weightage, you cannot show anything. You cannot showcase anything. Experts will ask you, how do you showcase your good things? Here is an opportunity. But you, first of all, the concept of best practice you should know. And good practice you should know. What are the best and good practices uh, people have already adopted? I think many uh, such... Uh, uh, informations are available on the websites of different universities and colleges. They, they wanted to popularize themselves. Therefore, they have put their best practice on their sites. You can go through it, find out how they have done, how they have evolved, and how they are calling this as best practice. And later on, see, based upon this background, even NAC also has published a few books on best practice series you can refer. And based on that, you can plan for your own institution. And when the accrediting agency is coming, you can just show and get the credit. I think showcasing is important. Unless you do, it is not possible. And there are people, the universities and colleges I have come across, they have conducted a series of workshops on best practices. Thereby they say, no, sir, why do you conduct so many? One workshop, will, will it not do? And I ask them, no, sir, we are conducting because last time you have got less weightage out of 30. This time, next time when you go for the next cycle, we want it to get out of out. Therefore, that is our plan. That is our goal. That's why we are conducting all this. Why not? That is a good idea. In the same way you can do it, then institutional distinctiveness, in what way your institution is distinct from that of the other. Like NAC's building is quite distinctive compared to the other buildings which are close by. Uniqueness is there. In the same way, what about your distinctiveness, institutional distinctiveness in terms of your value, value development programs or the holistic uh, uh, education programs? Uh, some uh, of the important program that you can introduce in your institution level and thereby you can say our institution is distinct. Every day we conduct uh, let a, a, a series of programs for the poor children, government college students, or we have adopted some government institutions. We are helping them, providing this facility. I think where there is a will, there is a where there is a mind, there will be action. And you should be able to think and so that it is possible. That's why we are given weightage. But weightage compared to best practice is not so much for this. However, it is there in that way, 100, 100. And totally upon 1,000, 1,000 is common for all because we are giving the, yeah, this is the common base on which the uh, accreditation is being done. And uh, this is uh, available on our uh, 
uh, website, NAC website. And uh, this will give you a procedural details completely starting from the IIQA stage, HAI registration, IIQA submission, then SSR submission. After SSR submission, you have two parts that will be there, QNM as well as QLM. QNM part, it goes to the DV people. They verify pre-qualification is it there or not. They check that. They correspond to you. And whatever the data that you have provided, they will verify. They give little time. Within that, you are supposed to give an explanation. If they are convinced now, they implement. Not convinced, they may. Lot of rejection procedure is also there. I, I think you can go through it. You will get much more details because the paucity of time, I may not be able to go very much in detail. And then the last part after everything is the entry point is registration and the outcome part is the declaration of the grade uh, once when the peer team report submitted to NAC. I think uh, we are very fast, I think. Uh, thanks to our officers, advisors, deputy advisors, assistant advisors of NAC. Uh, they are doing extremely well. Uh, and in fact, uh, the announcement of the results also, they are very fast. Earlier, they used to take a lot of time. Peer team visit came, the SSR submitted, QNM 70% assessment has been done here. Then the peer team came, submitted, sir, what happened to our results? But now it is not like that. There are cases where by the time peer team members have submitted our ICT unit, based upon that system generated scores, already done the whole process now, they were ready to declare the results. There are one or two such instances where before the peer team members uh, reach their hometown, before that only announcement was given. I think NAC is uh, the institution friendly and peer team members are institutional friendly. They are there to help you but you have to just make use of their benefit. And anywhere, any place, if certain things are not clear, our director always says now, you are welcome to contact our officials in the proper channel. You have got the help desk. You can also send the mail, get all your doubts clarified. Therefore, the whole system is very open and people are ready to help you here. And main objective is by helping you, many institutions will come for accreditation and more the number of accreditation our country will uh, uh, will be in a position to progress further and it gives an indication that higher the level of education higher the level of uh, uh, research uh, the, the, these two are the best indicators to show that the country is moving forward country is competing country is uh, keeping the global standard in mind and proceeding i think that's why all these details are there you can just take check you will get an idea now friends i think uh, I think just see, sir. Uh, madam, another two minutes. I think Ruchi already entered. There's two minutes. Uh, Suresh Babu. Uh, slide, slide. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then just share that once again because there are there are two more slides. I think I'll uh, two, three are there. Just check that. Okay. Uh, Ruchi, madam, just two minutes. I think we'll come back. Okay. Uh, shall I shall I change it or you will change? Shall I change? Okay, one minute. I I'll uh, yes. <coughs> I think the rejection procedure also I've just mentioned here. And uh, then uh, the uh, online, online anytime during the year, you can submit your IAQS. That information is already there. In case, in case of rejection of IAQ applications, specific suggestions would be given to you why we are rejecting. You have submitted your IAQA, sir, rejected back. Why rejected? You cannot say, sir, we do not know. But experts are there from our side to tell you your IAQ is rejected because of the following reasons, one, two, three, four, five. And ultimately, they facilitate them to resubmit the IAQ. There is a provision. An institution can reapply twice after the first attempt has resulted in rejection. You have, a, so you, you have submitted your IAQ. It has rejected. But still, you can have uh, two more opportunities to submit uh, your IAQ. That is, each HEI is permitted three attempts in a year. Therefore, in the big, okay, beginning of the academic year, let us say Jan or uh, February, uh, you applied, rejected. Then I think you will be having two more chances till the December of that particular academic year. Uh, then I think they will decide. Uh, uh, then uh, if it is accepted, you will go to the next stage and then pre-qualifying stage and other things are there. And whatever the fee that you have submitted, single fee, the same fee can be adjusted and they do this also. For further clarification, uh, kindly contact our help desk people. 
and also ICT people, they are going to just share and then help. Then after the acceptance of the IAQA, the next stage is submission of your SSR or uh, self-study report with the required documents to be uploaded. I think this is very, very important. Any self-study report you are submitting or a, 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 any, any chapter or any unit there, uh, then you, you are supposed to, any criteria, you are supposed to provide all the necessary uh, documents. That's why if you refer to quantitative matrix, there are three or four aspects you will easily see. Uh, provide the data, ask for the data template, number one. Provide the photos wherever necessary. Provide the videos wherever necessary. Geo tag wherever necessary. Or provide a certificate, so duly certified by head of the institution or the principal. Or provide the translation of the Hindi version to English, which is uh, duly signed by the principal. Like that, <clears throat> if you refer to those uh, uh, quality metrics, beautifully you come across the what type of evidence that we are seeking. You have a database about all those things and accordingly it is possible for you to provide the necessary documents. The SSR has to be submitted online. The SSR comprises of both quantity and quality as I mentioned. These details already I have mentioned. Accordingly, you can adhere to it and you can. And then optional metrics also there in some places. Uh, but now I think the trend is not to give and which one you have to opt out. I think the conditions are there. You can kindly refer to the instructions and the guidelines, whatever we are given. And uh, which are the uh, metrics which are not applicable to you also, keeping that in mind, you can opt out certain metrics. Provision is also made for the HAs to opt out some of the metrics which may not be applicable to them for various reasons. Then the calculation of the cumulative grade point average of higher education institutions will be done, excluding the metrics as opted out. Supposing 1000 marks, let us say, 30 uh, weightage or 3% weightage, you have got freedom in some places depending upon the uh, college, um, not for the university, I think. Uh, you can have a freedom and you can opt out those and so that in the total marks, they remove that box and the remaining marks only they are going to calculate and provide the grade to you. Out of 1000 days to calculate, opt out matrix probably, since they have opted few matrix, the total may come to 935, maybe accordingly that they are going to calculate. The data submit and quantity matrix will be subjected to a validation exercise with the help of a data, data validation verification. As I said, third party people, and they are going to communicate to you and they will give you what type of evidences you are given, it is not correct. Sometimes they also will guide you how you have to provide the evidences. In such situation, better you have the reference of the SOP. For university manual we have got, autonomous other cars also we have got this standard operation uh, procedure. And if you refer to it, will give you uh, some idea how exactly your document should be there, some reference point. Responses to the qualitative as well as quantitative I mentioned. And then, and the PRT members, when, once when they go, they go and they come to your institutions only keeping the 30% of uh, Mars weightage, wherein they'll be having certain qualitative matrix and they ask some questions, evidences, and they ask you to take you to such places for a physical verification, all those things, intangible things, uh, they keep in mind and they'll be just testing it. Pre-qualification, as I mentioned, the uh, quantum metrics of SSR will be taken for pre-qualification, not QLM because uh, PR team has not entered. Though you have given information about QLM in SSR, they may not consider, they come consider only the quantitative metrics, which are then SSR, based upon the 25% eligibility is there or not. If they are convinced that, I think you get 25% and more, they say, all right, green signal is given to you to proceed for the higher level. After the DV process, NAC will intimate the higher education institutions regarding the status of the pre-qualification, only pre-qualified, I uh, mentioned about it. So in satisfaction survey is equally important, uh, SSS we call, it will be conducted simultaneously with the DV process. After you submit, when the DV process has taken it, and uh, from our end, I think uh, some formula we have given here, 50% uh, of currently enrolled students as per data template format in Excel sheet is given in the portal for higher education institutions. There they have mentioned for colleges, they are saying 10% of the student, uh, student population or 100, whichever is less for some UGPG colleges. For university, they say 10% uh, of the student population or 500, whichever is less. Therefore, they have given the conditions. Accordingly, they collect the emails, the questionnaire with 20 plus 1, 
uh, it goes to the students and students should not be guided. Students should not be uh, dictated any kind of notes. Students have to respond to these questions on their own and confidently they have to send. And I think come to ICT, ICT will just uh, assess that under that particular category. Based on the size and scope, two to three uh, days visit to two to five days visit will be there depending upon the size of the institution, peer team members will be coming. The visiting team's role would be verify specific in the revised model, uh, model limited to quality metrics only. Teams would play an important role in reviewing the intangible aspects. Therefore, they come, they have got every right to ask, every right to verify, every right to show the lab, show the library, show the registers and so many things physically. I think you have to cooperate with them. <clears throat> and how you cooperate, how you convince them in terms of the date, in terms of the duration, in terms of old or new documents, accordingly they will be giving and uh, weightage. Policy to withdraw accreditation applications by higher education institution. Sometimes you have submitted SSR, you are not happy. You are permitted to take that also and then resubmit. They have given some condition. <clears throat> then, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, one year from the date of submission of SSR, you will be allowed to apply for ANDA within the duration in case you have applied, you want to take it back because of some reasons, then re-enter the whole thing and within that year you can just submit. I think for further details, kindly refer to the manual because uh, in our website, they update any kind of change is there that they are going to update. Then uh, non-compliance means institutions are given 15 days time to complete the DV process. If they ask you, come on, you have submitted. We are uh, representing the DVV unit. We are asking you to provide the information within 15 days. You have to do it. If you do not provide, probably they have got a mechanism to check that either to reject or whatever you have submitted based upon your earlier data, they draw some conclusions and take a decision. The final result of the assessment accreditation exercise will be an ICT based score, which is combination of evaluation of quantitative as well as qualitative, very important. This will be compiled as a document comprising of three parts. I think this you should know. Part one is the peer team report. Therefore, for 30%, the peer team members will be giving uh, their report. It will come to the NAC, supposed to hand over anything. They have to fill it up and online they have to submit uh, because they have got access to our portal. Therefore, they submit the whole thing directly. It goes to the ICT. The chairman may be supposed to do the task, chairman of the visiting team. Part two, graphical representation based on quantum matrix. Our ICT unit beautifully, they have done a graphical representation. Uh, I think I have got just one or two here. And in the graphical representations, what they do, uh, different types of graphs will be there, pertaining to the quality matrix, pertaining to the quantity matrix. Like that, you'll be having different types of different types of graphs that they'll be providing. And high performance matrix, where you are <clears throat> where the institution has performed well, where it has performed low, all details they'll be uh, providing. This is also a system generated based upon that quantum matrix information, whatever you have provided. How nicely they have done it and highly transparent here. And uh, even uh, peer team members, before they could go and do that, they may not be knowing. Uh, they submit it and at the ICT level only, we will be having all this information. Then part three, you will be having instant grade sheet. Uh, the above three parts will come together and ultimately they use all the three. One is a peer team report, graphical representation also speaks about your performance, etc. An institution grade sheet will also be there where different criteria and why that they have done it based upon that they'll be doing. And uh, then uh, the CGPA calculation part, <clears throat> it consumes a lot of time. I may not be able to just uh, do it. And uh, <clears throat> you have got a different types of uh, uh, sheets you'll be knowing. And how to calculate also, they'll be just uh, giving criteria wines we can calculate. I think. Uh, uh, some of these things are very transparent and you can see once when it is submitted there. How do they calculate everything is there and the report writing will also be there and uh, whatever the bullet points in which the peer team members are supposed to write that information is also available. Then uh, lastly, the final grade should be there on the basis of the CGP obtained by the institution in maximum possible score of four, the zero to four, the final grade is assigned on a seven point scale as shown in table three below. 
the seven point scale is like this. Uh, if the final score, very important, if it is 3.51 and above, you will be considered as A plus plus grade. 3.26 to 3.5 A plus, 3.01 to 3.25 A, uh, 2.76 to 3.00 plus plus, 2.5 the details. And then the C grade means between 1.51 to 2.0. We agree it. Some of them I, I objected, sir. Why do you want it to, uh, last one? Why do you want it to give D grade? Why do you want to give D grade? And then they say you are not accredited. The very fact that they have come to you, they have accredited. But I think experts have followed this technique. Uh, time being, it will be there. Therefore, anyone gets less than 1.5 after coming for the accreditation, considered as not accredited. Uh, therefore, uh, all these procedures, they follow very systematically. Uh, Institution friendly, it will be there. And uh, every information is available, transparent. And uh, therefore, this is what I wanted to just share to all of you. And there are institutions which have got A++. And a lot of benefits they get it, getting huge grants from DRUSA. And there are institutions which have got less than C. Also must have been provided by the uh, their managements because they have not done well. Uh, therefore, do not be disheartened those who are here, those who are here between B, C, B plus, etc. That means you are not prepared well, you have not guided well, uh, you, 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 maybe you have not taken uh, more interest to go to the right source and collect the information. Maybe you have failed to provide the necessary documents. Some of these reasons are there and that's why you kindly participate in our assessors orientation program, participate in our awareness program, our experts, Advisors, deputy advisors, advisors, and assistant advisors, uh, they are always doing this kind of task to help the institutions now. If you register and if you participate in our programs, little more clarity you are going to get it. I think uh, this is what I wanted to just share about this. Uh, appeals mechanism is also there if you are not happy about uh, the degrade. Sir, we expected 3.21, we got uh, 2.89, we are not happy. Appeals mechanism is there, procedure is there, you can apply, you will be getting it. And reassessment, as I said, it is also possible. Uh, to ensure the transparency in the process of assessment accreditation, it is necessary for the higher education institutions to upload the SSR along with other relevant documents in your website only, uh, so that I think uh, uh, you also will be knowing how you are prepared for accreditation. And NAC also is ready to get some of the information directly from your website. Therefore, I thank all of you for listening to this. And in case you have got any questions to ask, I think uh, we are ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ruchi Tripathi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think uh, uh, this is the right time to, uh, we are in concluding stage. We are in the end of the program. Uh, a very good evening to all of you. I, Dr. Ruchi Tripathi, Assistant Advisor NAC. We all gathered here in online mode. For this lecture series six, Upanyan Malika topic conceptual clarification and operationalization and accreditation process program. And the program is now at its concluding stage. And Thanksgiving, it is my privilege and joy to propose a vote of thanks. No, no, before that, this before that, do they, do they have any question? Please ask one or two questions. I do not know. Because usually we used to have interaction. Ruchi, madam, one or two questions. Please check up. Yeah. Ruchi, yeah Lakshmi, Yes, sir. Uh, hand over to Pusha, Pusha Lakshmi. I think she will just connect. No question. Ah. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Smita Vada, one. Okay. Person, they want to ask questions, sir. You yeah, may yeah, ask yes. a question, Dr. Smita. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yes, madam. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, I am talking from uh, Pune. Um, I teach in MES Garware College of Commerce Pune. I'm the IQC coordinator over there. And um, we have completed uh, three cycles of NAC. The last cycle was in the year 2016-17. And um, we are uh, now uh, uh, on the verge of preparing the SSR and we are doing all these formalities. We had applied to UGC for the autonomous status. And uh, we have got a letter from the UGC that uh, autonomy shall be granted from the year from the next academic year, 2021-22. So, uh, sir, my question now is that uh, I would like to know whether we have to undergo the NAC assessment process um, or is there any change in the assessment process? 
Uh, I think because the manual for affiliated college is different and the manual for autonomous college is different. Uh, therefore, uh, there is a technical issue here. Uh, I, 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 my suggestion would be you write a letter, you write a letter to the uh, NAC uh, requesting uh, that you will be getting the UGC autonomous status in the year. Which year you said? Which year you said? Sir, 21, 22. Next year. Uh, therefore, yeah, th that's why you kindly mention and you can ask them uh, your queries. I think you, you will be replied. That is the best way because it is a technical issue. I do not want to drag uh, and confuse you. Therefore, please do that. Uh, therefore, we will reply to you and so that accordingly you can proceed, man. Thank you. Just two days back, I have sent a mail to NAC. Uh, ah. We have also sent a letter by. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we haven't we, received we, we, any reply from yeah, them. We, we are waiting. You, you, you. Okay, madam. What you can do, you can you can contact our help desk. Plus, you also can send the message to us, and we will do the follow up. I think I also will pass on this information definitely. Okay. Yes, right. sir. Yes, Doctor yeah. Rajendra Shinde wants to ask a question. Okay. Doctor Rajendra Shinde, you can ask yes. a question. Yeah. Good e good evening, sir. I am the principal yeah, of St. Xavier's, St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, Autonomous. Okay. Uh, we we are 152 years old institution. And okay. The major major difficulty is the documents. We you know we are not finding the documents which are, for example, my geology department is recognized department for a PhD program since 1932. Okay. But for the re uh, we have to upload the certificate of uh, affiliation to the university okay. the latest affiliation the okay. university is asking us to show us the old letters okay. and we don't we can't find those old letters so how do we tackle this kind of situation yeah. yeah no to the best of my knowledge number one you have to make a sincere attempt uh, to dig and find out the possibility of getting the document number one the extreme case if you do not get it uh, try to find out legally any possibility of uh, giving some declaration that you had that you have established that in that way uh, legally whether you can just say that you had you, you are not able to produce a certificate but you had that also like that any kind of declaration support by the witness can you give it or not i think you can try that uh, that's that the best way uh, otherwise it is difficult because you are saying very old some documents are not available uh, but the authorities, those who are coming for inspection or accreditation, they ask you, we want the document. Without the document, they may not do any kind of assessment. Therefore, uh, two possibilities, evidences can be uh, as it is and as expected, or evidences can be based upon some kind of logical support and legal support you can produce, stating that you had and uh, that is missing. Uh, they may consider to some extent, that is the only possible way. I don't know. What is your reaction, sir, quickly? No. Sir, uh, uh, I have, for example, in my library, copies ah. of the thesis submitted to the University of Mumbai since 1932. Okay. So I, I, showed the, I showed the whole list of theses so far submitted to the university, hmm. and university said, okay, we can just give you a letter saying your department is recognized temporarily from this date. Okay, you know, but not not ready to give me a letter saying, you know, uh, I'm my department is permanently recognized. Now it's it's uh, a very tricky situation. I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, therefore, yeah. still, I think you you have to convince the authorities there uh, because it is a tricky situation which uh, <laughs> which calls for a special type of response from the concerned people. I agree. Right. Because yes. if, 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 if everything is very clear, they did not bother so much and you also need not bother. Because it is a tricky situation, uh, you have to manage the tricky situation by providing whatever the evidence that you are having. And one cutoff point up to this, we are here. Before that, we were here. Up to this, we are very strong. Keeping that in mind, can you just refer back and then give something? Some okay. weightage, some response, some convincing. That's the only way, uh, <clears throat> Professor, I can convince you. Thank you. No, so, so one more, Thanks. sir. One, sir, one more question. Yeah. Uh, mm. Under the UGC guidelines, UGC statutes for autonomous colleges, it says yeah. one-time permanent affiliation. 
so yeah. when we became when when we became uh, autonomous we have paid the amount to the uh, university for affiliation can that okay. be considered as a one time affiliation for these programs do we have no, to I keep did... on continue do we have that, to keep why... paying the <clears throat> continuous uh, uh, affiliation fees uh, that, that's why you you have to just find out what exactly operationally it means now one time one time fees or one time whatever that you have mentioned one you time affiliation find... fees ah uh, yeah and the one time affiliation fees means you have to ask them uh, earlier this concept was there in some place i was also familiar uh, but uh, later on we came to know one time affiliation fees was there then the, some gap came institution was not affiliated therefore they asked the institution because of the gap it is as good as first time you are going to affiliate and you have to pay some kind of confusion that they had therefore my suggestion would be you write a letter to the concerned people and try to understand what exactly they mean by saying one time uh, affiliation fees uh, you try to find out they must have defined that in their book or in their uh, reference uh, kindly keep that as a base and then write a letter sir otherwise it's difficult it is difficult for me because how they have defined for example we say uh, accreditation period for going for next cycle we say sometimes 5 years sometimes 7 years but you are defined in which case it is 5 years in which case it is 7 years we De defined in that way try to find out uh, how they have defined and uh, accordingly you have to proceed thank you next one yes, any sir. question ah. yeah dr mohinder wants to ask a question yeah mohinder uh, quickly uh, if yeah. a college is accredited with A plus grade, then okay. after three years, the college is, uh, has got the autonomous status. Okay. Then at that time, whether the accreditation will be uh, after further uh, plus two years means five years, or freshly there will be registration with the NAC. And also because they have sent the AQRs for three years, now how okay. in form of autonomous uh, college the AQRs will go sir i want to yeah you're from, you, you, you're from which college man uh, i am from government college for girls ludhiana actually sir oh okay uh, in any of this particular part already we have received few letters regarding this uh, therefore i will clarify once again i'll clarify and uh, i think if you can uh, uh, write to our help desk and connect it to me connect it to some officers no we will clarify and we will tell you exactly Okay, because these are technical issues. Morally, I think we should not discuss, uh, depending upon the case. Because orally, you are saying sometimes the date we may require all those information. Therefore, kindly write to us. We will come back as the other person also asked. No, I have recorded. I have written this question, and we will come back to you. Is it okay? Is is it okay? Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, then, uh, right, that's better because we have got three or four such questions. The reason is there. Uh, the reason is uh, autonomous college status is different as an affiliate college status is different. Then, uh, as an affiliated college, I must have got A grade in the first cycle. The moment I move on from affiliated college to the autonomous college, uh, my preparation should be better. And uh, some metrics are also uh, whatever I have answered for certain metrics as an affiliated college, the, that metric, those metrics may be different here. Therefore, certain technical reasons are there. Therefore, the compat compatibility and matching also may come. Uh, therefore, keeping that point, let us see how they are defined and what uh, uh, preference or option that they can give for in such situations. I will find out, come back to you technically. Thank you. Next one. Next question. Thank you, sir. Dr. S.B. Nageshwar Rao. Uh, thank you very much, sir, thank for you. your excellent thank you. Uh, presentation with uh, full clarity. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> sir, you uh, said uh, uh, some uh, universities, they have off campus. Uh, the P team is visiting the main campus. Okay. What about the facilities at the off campus? I, uh, they, I, I think uh, they have it, to see. Uh, Definitely. Uh, I uh. think they have to visit. They have to visit and they cannot take that as an option. Therefore, they have to visit the off-campus also mm. uh, because, because some information pertaining to the off-campus is also shown in the SSR. Therefore, there is a need to verify and give a weightage to it. Uh, 
therefore they have to visit this off campus also oh I thank you, sir. Very, but very yeah. long distance. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you. Hmm. Therefore, anyhow, you, you find out once again, this is my experts are also there. They come back. We keep this also to there. And whenever they are organizing this uh, uh, assessor's orientation program, I will pass on these things and they also will share and they answer your question. But uh, you also can find out uh, there are universities which have got the uh, off campus, uh, um, off campus where they are running some courses. Uh, try to find out in case they have been accredited, accredited by NBA, for example. Try to find out how exactly that they have done it. That also may give you some more information for your better understanding. But I think they have to visit that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gayatri Patil. Hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, yes, you are audible, madam. Good evening, sir. Uh, you yeah, have given evening. us very wonderful uh, guidance for us because we are new for this. And okay. sir, my question is that we are teacher education college and we yeah, yeah. sent a PKR last in 2015-16 by email. Okay. Because uh, we have been stopped to uh, send uh, a QR because we okay. have joined QCI. So what should yeah. I do? send a QR of 2015-16 again? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, you see, uh, Madam, you have answered this question earlier. Uh, therefore, two, two possibilities are there. As I mentioned, now we are accepting a QR online only. Therefore, you please make sure whether all the 2015-16, the from 2015-16 onwards, Maybe earlier to 2015, you must be submitting the hard copies only. Therefore, make sure that your AQR can have a two parts. One can be updating with the online, whatever the date that they have given to submit online, that date you can keep. If it is for three, three years, then the backward, if you go, the two years uh, information before or prior to the online submission of AQR, you can submit that as an hard copy with a certificate. You can send these two together for teacher education institution that they are accepting, but in future, everything should be submitted online only. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Any other question? Vishal Lakshmi? Uh, yes, sir. I'm not able to see any uh, virtual okay, hand okay, raised. Then um, we will ask Ruchi, Ruchi Tripathi, madam. And in, in case you wanted to add one or two clarifications, you can add and uh, thank everybody. Uh, I hope all the queries are uh, over and uh, yeah. question answer session is over. And yeah. uh, thank you, sir. They are resolving very much uh, easy way all the questions answer session. Now I think this is the time to propose the vote of thanks. So uh, sorry to interrupt earlier. Uh, yeah. Some maybe some questions are there, but we are in the mood of uh, question answer. We I I suppose I thought it may be over. So okay, sorry, no, no. audience. Okay, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, on behalf of NAC, uh, we welcome all, and this is the right time to propose the vote of this. in the lecture series six, Upanyasa Malika topic: conceptual clarification and operationalization accreditation process. I privilege and enjoy the proposal vote of thanks. Uh, first, I would like to thank our honorable director, Dr. S. S. Masar, for his support and encouragement to facilitate this program. We are also thankful to our Dr. Sikan Swami, sir, academic expert, research and analysis wing. Thank you, sir, for making this thank program God. memorable. I also thank thanks Dr. Nilesh Pandey, assistant advisor, for welcome the program. And on behalf of NAC, I heartily vote our thanks to all the academician invitees for their gracious presence and participation. Thank you all. We have been half fortunate enough to be backed our team and motivated, dedicated colleagues like advisors, deputy advisor, assistant advisor, consultant, academic, administrative staff, finance staff, SFLO, and other. Before conducting, let me express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to coordination of this program. Our academic expert, Srikan Swami sir, Dr. Milesh Pandey, uh, Mr. Samuel, ICT system analyst, 
एंड अवर नेक नेक फैमिली दिस मेमोरेबल दिस प्रोग्राम uh let uh, last but not the least uh, we have thankful to each and everybody who are directly and indirectly involved in making this program even a great success at the end let me share a very co good quote by the dr sarobali radhakrishnan ji reading a book gives us the habit of solitary reflection and enjoyment thank you very much thank you all namaskar namaskar and thank you thank you sir yeah pushya lakshmi Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Samuel is also there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Samuel, because uh, I couldn't hear anything from you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, Samuel, you are there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, no. I wanted to utilize your service for one or two questions, but I couldn't see you. Okay. Next time okay. we will do it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you